Uh, Michael chaired a committee, a commission, uh, to review uh, the way we measure inflation. And it was uh, extremely important when he did that in the late 90s. And uh, that topic has actually gotten more and more important as time goes by, and the contribution of that commission has been more and more important. One of the key issues is how you uh, adjust for quality changes and improvements in technology and so forth. And Michael pointed out a lot of biases in the measurement of inflation. Some of the corrections have been made, and some are more urgently needed uh, than ever. But that was the most important uh, commission. Uh, I could go on about his teaching prizes, about uh, other uh, national awards that he has received, but you came to hear him talk, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Michael. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Um, one great thing about being introduced by a good friend is you don't have to make any side payments to get him to say nice things about you. Um, I should say that John has his own list of important policy uh, advising and achievements. Uh, those of you taking money out of uh, retirement accounts late in life and dealing with some of those tax traps, uh, John's research helped, was a big contributor to adjusting some of those problems. Uh, and in addition, um, I see Chuck Schwab here, so uh, if you like paying lower tax rates on dividends, uh, John, I, and Chuck Schwab, when we were flying down to Waco shortly after Bush 43 became president, uh, decided to launch the idea of a dividend tax cut on President Bush, and a year later, and show you how things come around, great job by Glenn Hubbard to shepherd that, and it became law in 2003. So uh, I think we should give John one more tremendous round of applause for the great job he's done. So Uh, one of the great joys in life, uh, especially when you get to my age, is that you've been involved in helping to start something, and long after you're playing uh, uh, any central role at all, it goes on to bigger and better things, and that's what John, John's done at CEPR, so it's uh, just tremendous to see it. Uh, with this transition, with John stepping down after all this time, and Mark uh, stepping in as uh, director of CEPR, I thought maybe the best thing I could do would try to give a very broad overview, this may be a little lowbrow for some of the uh, professors in the room, of what I consider to be our single most important economic problem, which is how to, uh, how to develop a strategy that is more likely to lead to sustained higher economic growth. Uh, President Kennedy uh, was a bit hyperbolic when he said, a rising tide lifts all boats but it sure as hell lifts more than any other tide, and it leaves a lot fewer sanded, stranded or stunk. So I believe this is our single biggest policy priority, and the way I thought I'd talk about it today is in a long-run sense, not just the next few quarters. I'll say a word about the, the exit from extreme monetary and fiscal measures in a second. But I want to look at what is really a very de perplexing dilemma which is for more or less the first time, maybe since the Depression, maybe in American history, a majority of Americans say they expect their children not to be as well off, their children and grandchildren not to be as well off as they are, which is quite a remarkable thing. Now, obviously, some of that is due to the deep recession and the uh, very slow recovery, uh, but it also bodes uh, and implies a deep uneasiness about a variety of other things. Maybe that's competition from China, maybe it's uh, technology, maybe it's a variety of things. But it really is, I think, really important to try to come to grips with what is likely to affect the type of economy our children and our grandchildren will inherit. Not just, be, not just for those of you who are worrying about that at the moment, uh, but it is something I think that will underpin uh, the political possibilities in economic policy for a long time to come, and I think it will heavily influence the election in 2016. So I'm just going to say a few words about several, um, and before I do that, though, I want to let you know or give an example of how audacious this idea is. If I had been here or anyone else, George Schultz, Chuck Schwab, John, Mark, etc., 
George, by the way, is the person who introduced me to President Reagan and got me onto President Reagan's Tax Policy Advisory Task Force. So, uh, to the extent any of my influence had any influence on those uh, IRAs and 401ks, thank George for it. But if any of us were sitting here a generation ago, and since John mentioned President Reagan, and I just did, let's take 1980 as a starting year. Suppose somebody was sitting in this, the predecessor of this room, or this room had been built back then, and said, what do we think the world's going to look like for our children and grandchildren, say, in 2015? Well, in 1980, we were in the midst of a second oil crisis. Stagflation, simultaneously high inflation and unemployment, read misery index and helped elect President Reagan. Deng Xiaoping had just begun to open China. Rajiv Gandhi's reforms in India, drawing it back a bit from the Raj state, were a decade in the future. Competition from Japan was nascent, was not a big issue. In Asia, there was a small, interesting success story, the Asian tigers, Taiwan, Singapore, South Korea, and Hong Kong. But Asia wasn't really on America's radar screen, economically in any event. The personal computer had recently been invented. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was under 1,000. Women had had roughly a 60% of male pay for a long time. One of, our former, one of our colleagues, retired colleagues, Victor Fuchs, codified that and it's sometimes called Fuchs Law. It doesn't hold anymore, as we'll see in a second. If I would have said then that two rounds of successful disinflation would launch a quarter century boom, that women would close half the pay gap with men and become a majority of college graduates, that several hundred million people would have been lifted out of abject poverty in China in a generation, the, giant, the Chinese economy would be globally systemically important, that the combined GDP of the developing and emerging market economies would exceed that of the advanced economies by now, that Italy and Germany would share a common currency, let alone the other 17. that the internet would have us all connected, that first 3D seismic imaging itself partly the result and the beneficiary of lower processing costs. And then fracking would lead to two revolutions and radically reduce dependence on OPEC for oil. That communism would collapse as an intellectual force, except of course on some college campuses. Um, and and a sensible way to even begin to think about organizing an economy and a polity. All these uh, and many more happened in that generation. And if I had suggested back then, or anybody else had got, suggested that, you probably would have said, what's gone into Michael? Is he off his meds? What's going on? You know? <laughs> so, I want to remind you that um, I'm going to talk about the factors. I'm not going to necessarily talk about the outcomes, although I am a bit more optimistic than many people about where we're going to be a generation from now. It won't be easy, but I'm a bit more optimistic. So I think as we think about that future, we should all bear in mind the immortal words of the greatest of all American philosophers, Yogi Berra, when he said, predictions are tough, especially about the future. Okay. So let's go over a few of these. First, I'll list them, say a word about them. So here are the seven big questions. First, since the medium and long run are the rolling out of the short run, what, what is the current source of our problems? Is it still cyclical? Is it structural? Is there a re are we about to take off? Is there a reason the recovery has been so sluggish? The labor market's picked up some in the last year, but uh, the overall output growth remains sluggish. And what happens, we've had these extraordinary measures undertaken by the Federal Reserve, QE, $4 trillion balance sheet, we'll see a picture about that in a second, and some tremendous uh, explosion of deficits and debt, some 
obviously caused by the recession itself, a, a sensible automatic response to the recession as tax receipts collapsed and um, some automatic spending increases went into effect, for, into, into place, like an unemployment insurance. But some of the result of deliberate actions, and we now have a much higher debt GDP ratio, and we're arguing about whether we should try to do something about that now or not worry about it for a few more decades. Uh, just to give you a sense of that, this is not my prediction. I think this is unlikely. But if the money multiplier and velocity returned to their pre-crisis levels, the price level would triple. So I think this is unlikely to occur. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that how we manage the exit from these extreme measures is a non-trivial task and has potentially serious consequences. Uh, we hear a lot of people now talking about so-called secular stagnation. Um, my best former student ever to become Treasury Secretary has uh, spoke at the CEPR Summit, Larry Summers, about that. And he has a view, and Bob Gordon, a colleague of mine on the Boskin Commission, uh, has a view on that. And the, there, there are a variety of nuances about this, but it starts from the observation, in, even before the uh, Fed's remarkable uh, interest rate policy and uh, QE uh, experiment, that there, there were low long-term interest rates relative to the 1980s. And there are a variety of explanations of that. Ben Bernanke thought we had a global savings glut, especially given the high saving rates in the developing world. China's economy has the lowest rate of consumption anyone's ever observed in a developing economy with actual data. Uh, most of that saving is in Chinese enterprises, not the household sector, but the household sector also has a high rate. So his view it was that the, this, quote, excess of saving is driving down interest rates. There are those who claim that we have a dearth of investment opportunities, and that is what's causing this to occur. Others have uh, demographic explanations and the like. And Bob Gordon's view is that we have a tremendous, um, a tremendous uh, misreading of technology history, and that the period from the late 19th, early 20th century to about 1970 was a remarkable period that is unlikely to be reproduced, uh, that was due to the confluence of a variety of tremendously important and uh, technologies that would widely benefit wide swaths of the economy, electricity, petroleum, chemicals, the automobile, et cetera, all converging in that period to greatly enhance productivity, and that uh, today's technology advances, uh, while interesting, are unlikely to do anything like for productivity and the strength of the economy what those previous technologies uh, have done. Well, there are lots of discussion of this, and I'll come back to it in a second. I tend to be a techno, at least quasi-optimist. Another side of this is, will the effects of technology and globalization on labor, on labor markets abate? We added over a billion people able to produce traded goods in the world with the opening of China, the lesser opening of India, the collapse of the former Soviet empire, uh, places that just we weren't trading with. And that has produced a considerable pressure on wages in the advanced economy. And especially when combined with technology. Now, economists debate are these and other factors. Uh, I believe these two are, dominate the rest. Uh, and there's a big question about the future. Will robotics lead to widespread unemployment? We'll say more, another word about that in a moment. Will demography overwhelm our fiscal, economic, and global position? And as a, we are going from three and a quarter, three workers per retiree to two. Uh, most of the rest of the world is in much worse shape than that, but it's going to strain ourselves in lots of ways due to uh, modest fertility rates and increased life expectancy. And, and for, a, for a period, the extra retirement for the baby boomers. And the question becomes, given that and other factors, will debt and taxes wind up leading us to European or Japanese-style stagnation? I think this is probably the single biggest risk facing the economy, but I'll talk about it a bit more in a moment. Will our future labor force be well enough educated? Part of our position, uh, heading in at least into the late 20th century, 
was the tremendous, uh, the tremendously more educated workforce we had than most of the rest of the world. But if you look at things like the fraction of the population completing high school or attending college, the latter is starting to rise a bit in the US. But that plateaued, and other countries are catching up. And then the other question is, will we have enough workers? Which obviously means something about immigration policy. It doesn't matter if we don't. Will the economy be flexible enough to adapt, and, uh, or will we just be so integrated with the rest of the world, those workers being in another country won't matter to us? That's politically it will, but economically we'll see. Will we reconcile our energy needs, which, are, which will be immense in the US and the, and the global economy for decades to come, with environmental risks, especially given the North American energy revolution, uh, fracking in the United States and uh, Canadian oil sands and the possibility of Mexico opening up to foreign investment, is the single biggest geopolitical and economic shift in America's favor since the fall of the Berlin Wall, in my opinion. And I'll say a word or two more about that as we go along. And then, you know, the rest of the world's important, not just uh, our view of who may be catching up. There are, there's, there are good economic theory reasons why other countries should be able to grow a little more rapidly than we do, uh, wh why wages there should start to catch up some, et cetera. Uh, solo growth model, factor price equalization, I won't bore you with the technical economics. Um, but the question is, what's going on in the rest of those countries? There are trading partners. So it's not good for us if they suffer. And there, we're also integrated with them in capital markets. And by the way, CEPR economists were heavily involved in helping change the economics profession into thinking about financial flows and trade flows, both. Uh, now maybe too many people think the financial flows determine the trade flows. I think they deter they're simultaneously determined. But um, all that's important. I'll say a word about the BRICS in a second. And of course, we have all the risks of war, terrorism, uh, global instability, and the like that can be quite economically disruptive. And then something that's uh, so my own current writing and thinking and research are democracy and robust capitalism in the end ultimately compatible. I'll say a word about that in a moment. So let's take a quick look. But let me mention that Stanford scholars are leaders in all of these areas. I won't mention all of them. A very large fraction of them are CEPR affiliated. Some of this work has been done. And uh, popular versions of it show up in the CEPR uh, policy briefs and uh, working papers and so on. So let's take a look. The short run, what's been going on? The average US real GDP growth, uh, it's almost been six years. The end of the month will be six years since the recession ended. Seems kind of remarkable. Has been a little over 2%. We shrank last quarter. A lot of that was due to the port strike and weather, but not all of it. Uh, out of previous deep recessions, we've grown much more rapidly. If we had had this actually for the first three years rather than the first almost six years, these numbers out of the earlier deep recessions in the 70s and 80s would be much larger, and our gap would be much wider. So. What has been singularly different about this period isn't just the depth of the recession. It was deep. The early 80s recession was deep as well. Matter of fact, unemployment was higher uh, in the depth of that recession than it ever got in this recession. But how slow the recovery has been. There are lots of issues, lots of, lots of blame to go around. I, I'll take questions on that if you want. I just want to make these points. Job growth has also been anemic, although the labor market has been strengthening. Um, most private forecasters expect more or less the same, mid two to high 2% growth. Um, they've been gradually ratcheting down. In the, earlier in the recovery, uh, most forecasters, the Obama administration was perhaps the most robust, the Fed was fairly robust, private forecasters not quite, but still robust. Uh, some of these people were expecting 4% growth the following year, and uh, year after year, and of course it never happened. Okay. On the exit, this is the CBO's baseline estimate in light red on the future debt and GDP ratio, uh, with the vertical line being today, uh, last year actually. And we can see the debt rose from slightly below its long run historical average before the uh, financial crisis and recession. It basically doubled to the mid 70s, the usual measure of debt we use, the publicly held debt. It's expected, if nothing goes wrong, to be stable for a while, 
The deficit's down as a share of GDP. But then to start rising inexorably. CBO also has an alternative forecast, which is less optimistic about some modest control of healthcare costs and some other things, and it goes to uncharted territory. So these are levels that have gotten lots of other societies in trouble. Now, is the US the same as Greece? Is it the same as Italy? Uh, is it the same as Denmark or Ireland, which had previous debt crises? No. Uh, we're a fifth of the global economy. We have, uh, we're the global reserve currency. But any sensible person would have to say that avoiding getting us headed in that direction have to, has to be a very high priority to decrease the risks our economy faces over the long term. If you read the CEPR policy briefs, you see I've actually done four ways of estimating what this would do to the economy. And the rough answer is, in a generation, standards of living would be 15 to 30 percent lower than they otherwise would have been. That's half to all of the difference between our standard of living and that in Western Europe, so it's pretty serious stuff. The Fed, of course, had this remarkable series of experiments. I supported the, they helped cause the problem in the first place by keeping interest rates too low in the, last, in the middle of the last decade in a boom. We had negative real interest rates and the economy was growing at 4 percent. However, uh, the initial lowering of interest rates, I held my nose at QE1, it was necessary, unfortunately. But as they get further and further along and started buying more and more assets, they were making the exit more and more complicated and the uncertainty greater. Uh, they started to talk a little bit about how they're going to manage the exit, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that, that will go okay. Uh, they're currently ra uh, raking in immense profits off the stuff they bought in the depths. Matter of fact, the Fed's remitting $100 billion a year to the Treasury and is by a factor of two or three the largest remitter. It's, they're, they're labeled corporate income taxes, the largest remitter of corporate income taxes to the Treasury. But the main way they've talked about avoiding having this flood of money and risk of inflation is to raise the interest they pay on borrowed re, on uh, excess reserves at the Fed. And if they have to start paying 3 and 4 percent interest, They'll be giving banks tens of billions of dollars. It's pretty unclear the uh, Elizabeth Warren and others would stand for that. So I, I don't think they'll get away with that. So hopefully they'll have a more sensible uh, meeting of the minds. Productivity growth has been uh, declining. Uh, there are two measures economists have of pro productivity, two different uh, concepts, labor productivity output per hour and total factor productivity, which nets out, capital deepening, and some other stuff. So I'm not going to bore you with the technical uh, aspects of this, but they've both been declining. And uh, hence this big argument, Gordon and others arguing, um, that this may, we, the bounce back won't even be to this, let alone to this, and we may wind up um, with very, very sluggish growth. Gordon's estimating the next quarter century will grow at one, uh, it'll grow at under 1% a year. So that would be compounded over a generation, an immense difference in output per person and in standards of living. So it kind of gets boring when you start talking about it. Over a year or two, it doesn't matter, but compounded over a quarter century, 30 years of a generation, and it, is, it makes the difference between a successful and a sick society. Labor's income has started to decline and not just in the United States as a share of national income, but almost everywhere. So not only has Fuchs' law been broken and the old Denison's law, the saving rate's constant, that was true until it wasn't and it was measured better, but, uh, and CEPR scholars helped do that. But labor income has been declining, uh, suggesting that um, our old Cobb-Douglas production functions were, uh, that those of you in Econ 1 or 101 took in college, we're more, uh, now more thought of as an exercise that's easy to do rather than as an accurate description of the economy. Uh, will demography overwhelm our fiscal position? The most rapid, we're going to about almost double the old aid dependency ratio in the United States, not quite. The fastest growing group in the population is over 85. The next fastest growing is over 75. The next fastest growing is 65 to 74. The good news is many of those that longer life expectancy, many of those years are good, and we're going to have to start counting life expectancy backwards, as John has been telling us to do for some time. But this will impose some tremendous adjustments on the economy. A flexible, dynamic market economy should be able to adjust. 
and will affect everything about our society, from where people live, to how they communicate, to the savings and insurance and other financial vehicles they'll need to deal with life's contingencies as it becomes common for four generations to be alive simultaneously in families. And it will definitely alter global patterns of saving and growth, and hence our geopolitical position. The good news, which we'll see in a moment, is that it's worse elsewhere. Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are the prime drivers of the debt and of this. And by the way, it's not primarily demography in either, in either in the Medicare or Social Security. It's primarily rising real benefits per beneficiary. So about 40-45% of Social Security's growing costs are demography, and about 70% uh, or, or of Medicare's about 30, 30 or 40 percent of most of Medicare is about 60 or 70 percent are due to rising real benefits per beneficiary. So it's crowding out the entire budget. This is the prediction in 2050 that it, almost the entire budget net of interest, 70 percent or more, will be on those three programs. It's already crowding out defense. Defense spending in President Obama's budget projection in 2019 will be at the lowest level since 1940. And worse yet, that's the dollars spent inside the defense budget. The same thing is going on as I just showed you in the overall budget. A larger and larger share of this spending in defense is going to health and retirement costs. And the dollars left over for active duty personnel, training, equipment, and technology will be shrinking. A huge national security problem I think we're only just starting to think about. Well, if we did this, let's do a simple calculation. Suppose we had to just cover, forgetting the debt in the interim, just cover the CBO's estimate of the deficit uh, a generation from now in addition. So we take the current tax system and, and increase it to cover the deficit. So the total will cover all spending projected a generation from now. To finance that with a proportional increase in income taxes or split between income and payroll taxes, a wide swath of the population would be facing marginal tax rates of 60% or more. At the top, it would be quite a bit higher. It's just a proportional increase, not even starting with raising it on higher income people. So this is a huge potential problem to be avoided. We can argue about what these programs ought to look like. But if we don't get these under control, the resources to do all the other functions of government, for people to have strong incentives to get ahead and work and save and invest, will dissipate. It's very hard to imagine a successful growing society where the vast bulk of the population, rather than a small number, in previous times we've had tax rates that high, it's applied in the 30s, and, uh, et cetera, it applied to a few hundred people who had, by the way, many av avenues of tax avoidance. It's hard to imagine such a society being dynamic and successful when you're a minority partner in your own labor. Now, it's more complex than that, but let me not get it. So I would say uh, we need to be careful and um, one of George's, uh, George Schultz's successor as Treasury Secretary is going to have to beat, uh, beat on this quite hard in the next administration to prevent it from happening. Whoops. Will our future labor force be well enough educated? Again, if we look at test scores, and we all know there are problems with test scores, we have three sets of problems. We tend to focus a lot, as we should, because who wants kids to lead uh, un- or counterproductive lives? We want them to be successful and have a life that participates in society uh, successfully. We focus on the low achievers, and we have far too many of those relative to other countries. And overall, we're not doing so well, and that's the bulk of our labor force, but we're also low on top performers. Now, we can argue whether Americans are going to all you know, have Steve Jobs kind of implicit genes and will be more creative than some in Singapore who are more rote, et cetera. But this has to be a tremendous concern because over the span of a generation, this can really, really undermine the foundation of our economy uh, by having a less skilled labor force than we could and should have. I also think we're going to need to pay a lot more attention to having economic-based sensible immigration reform to have uh, people coming in from other countries, uh, including the proverbial Stanford PhDs next week getting a, uh, a green card staple of their diploma when they're getting PhDs in STEM subjects. Energy production. 
If I had told you 10 years ago that America would increase its oil output by 4 million barrels a day, you would have said, what do you, you, know, what do you think? Where do you come from? But that's what fracking has done. The United States is now the largest oil producer in the world. You can get that number up or down a little, depending on whether you include condensates or natural gas liquids and so on. Uh, and we're probably the largest natural gas producer as well. And we have an opportunity with sensible policy, including allowing exports, LNG, export terminals, and so on, to greatly reduce the reliance, the strategic reliance, of Europe on Russian energy. And it's, in my view, one of the most um, idiotic and dangerous and uh, foolish and uh, complete lacking in any common sense strategic vision that we are not doing that. And uh, you know, I, uh, next time I'll tell you what I really think. Um, the rest of the world um, has also been struggling. If you think we've had a slow recovery, I'll be glad you're not in most places in Europe. Remember when the BRICs were going to be the global engine of growth? China and India are contracting. Pardon me, China and India are slowing, and Russia and Brazil are contracting. So a little bit of the um, glamour has gone off the bricks. Now, I think that this will turn around some. I think the coming two or three quarters are likely to pick up a bit. The, the April data are mixed, but are better than the last quarter. Uh, but we shall see. So in the short run, the outlook uh, tends to be the same 2.5%, uh, 3% growth for us and the Canadians and the Brits, and 1% to 2% for the Eurozone and much of Europe. Some of these countries have unemployment rates at Great Depression levels. Greece, for example. And you can double that for young people. An entire generation is growing up in conditions of no prospects. That's always been a dangerous recipe. George Schultz reminds me of that uh, often. And, um, the Europeans, if you think we have problems, the Europeans have five interrelated crises going on. They have a currency crisis. They have a banking crisis. They have a sovereign debt crisis. They have a governance crisis. And of course, they have an economic growth and employment crisis. So I propose some solutions based on my experience, some of which John alluded to, uh, uh, helping uh, Nick Brady with uh, Brady bonds and uh, having to sit on. I got I, this was mostly the Treasury's doing, but the SNL, the Resolution Trust Corporation, I got to spend two and a half years sitting on the oversight board, encouraging them finally getting to sell in large blocks, which wound up uh, rapidly resolving the savings and loan problem. So the IMF is again um, the U.S. a little under three percent, uh, and deep problems in Brazil and in Russia. There's another problem that's important to point out, and that is this issue of um, how our society is going to evolve, how our capitalist democracy is going to evolve. Mitt Romney's famous malaprop about the 47% who one would have hoped he would look at and say, I should figure out ways to try to get them into the market economy. Um, and that my, my vision is better than what they have now or will be. Um, the general notion that some people have, including people in this room who have told me this over a drink over the years, that when more than half the population is collecting benefits from the government, they'll start voting themselves more benefits, and taxes will keep going up, keep going up, keep going up, and whatever stops that process. Well, just a few facts about that and then my own conclusions and a quick summary. Uh, the Gini index is a rough measure of uh, inequality or equality. The higher numbers mean less equality, more inequality, uh, conditional on some assumptions you don't need to know about. The United States is an unequal society. There are many reasons for that. If everybody was the same, the actual static data would be quite unequal because of the age earnings profile. People in their 40s would have higher incomes than people in their 20s, even if they had the identical incomes over their lifetime. 
But there are many issues. The U.S. Accept, has accepted historically somewhat less equality than uh, the Europeans. But my point is that inequality has been increasing virtually everywhere, just as labor's income share in national income has been declining almost everywhere. So for those of you who think this was the Bush tax cuts or Obamacare, this couldn't have been just those things or primarily those things. It's going on everywhere. And that means it had to be some forces that were reflecting the global economy or most economies in the globe, uh, to which I conclude technology and globalization are the culprits. If we look, however, at the flip side of that, and you ask yourself, has the world become more or less equal? The world has come, become considerably more equal. Lots of people are becoming middle class in Asia, for example. So if we wind up measuring people regardless of where they are, inequality is decreasing, equality is increasing. So within country, inequality is increasing. Global inequality is decreasing. Of course, the former is more politically salient than the latter. Uh, for those of you worried about who's paying income taxes and who's receiving benefits, there are many ways to make these calculations. This is just to, to start the conversation. About 59% of tax returns reported paying positive taxes. 41% either paid nothing or got money back from the government. Not your tax refund reducing your tax from $10,000 to $6,000, but giving you actually a negative <coughs> pardon me, transfer payment, primarily the earned income tax credit, but many other refundable credits. So over 40% of tax returns don't pay taxes income taxes. People pay other taxes, they pay state sales taxes, they may pay payroll taxes and the like. And some people, by the way, don't file returns. On getting benefits, the census reports roughly 50%, about 35% get some sort of uh, means-tested benefit. Social Security and Medicare you get regardless of your income, so those are not means-tested. So are we getting near a precipice? Well, I've been thinking about this a lot, and my own research is in this area now. Uh, and it turns out the game theory is far more subtle and complex than that. It turns out that uh, well before you get to this notion of them, the, the people getting the benefits starting to raise taxes to close to 100% and sharing the income, the threat of other coalitions forming makes a big difference. Many of these people would rather have a job than be on benefit. Many of them are only on part of the time. The actual number who's on over a year or over five years is a larger number than this. The number of people who worry they might need that, that program is larger than this. People have multiple puts and takes. The people on Social Security are also paying taxes on their 401k withdrawals from their Schwab account. People care about their parents and grandparents and their children and grandchildren. So it's quite a bit more complex, and I've been trying to study what actually happens when the, there's a disruption in the income distribution and what actually happens, how does the tax transfer system respond to that. Uh, so maybe at some future time, Mark will have me back and I'll give you the results of that research. But I'm not nearly as pessimistic about this as uh, the simple calculation is. It's a worry, it's a concern. We ought not to be promoting government dependency. We should be counting the success of the program in part, is how many people got off of it back into a productive job. Uh, obviously, some people are frail and so on, and unable to work, but in general, that should be the case. This, the same conceit that measures, they used to measure libraries when there were books in libraries, they're actual physical books, not just e-books, by how many were on the shelf rather than how many out circulating. So we should be careful of that. I have my own views about an agenda for prosperity. I think much of this would be uh, shared by many economists, maybe not of the, uh, at the political extremes, but I believe we really have to, our, our primary focus must be on a comprehensive strategy that starts with rolling back some of these excesses, additional fiscal consolidation phased in gradually as the economy recovers, entitlement reform and tax reform, which maintains, now is to keep strong incentives to work, save, and invest. Starting, by the way, with reducing the subsidies in those programs to well-off people like me. Broaden the tax base to include more people and more economic activity. Too much economic activity escapes taxation. 
In Social Security, that's indexing and retirement ages. In Medicare, there are many discussions of that, but uh, that's a harder problem. I don't have time to go in depth at, but there have been a variety of suggestions. In the end, the governments can either ration health care by uh, regulation and direct rationing, as President Obama has proposed with his Independent Payment Advisory Board, or by price. I prefer the latter. I think it would be much more efficient, but that's the only way we'll be able to deal with that. Price, at least, can help elicit a supply response. Uh, the tax system, broad-based consumed income tax, and the like. The budget needs to be reformed because we need a, every successful society needs an effective government doing the things we need government to do. Our government does too many things and too many of them poorly. We have 46 different job training programs. Most don't have metrics. The ones that do aren't working. It'd be far better, and it spends $20 billion a year in nine different agencies. It'd be much better to have three that worked for half the money helping five times as many people actually get a job that exists in the private sector rather than in the uh, imaginings of people in the labor department uh, or nonprofits. We need to make fiscal and monetary policy much more predictable and permanent and eliminate the endless use of temporary measures. Our human capital policy is, uh, as I said, a foundation of our economy. So education, training, and immigration reform are all high on my list. On education reform, competition, I think, is at the heart of it, but it is far from the only thing that would be necessary. Maybe the Vergara decision, for those of you familiar with it in Los Angeles, will get us started uh, to try to untie that Gordian knot. Uh, free trade has always been uh, a pillar of a, glowing, a growing global economy. Now, yes, we've reduced tariffs substantially in many rounds of the, uh, of the GATT and in various bilateral and multilateral and regional free trade agreements, so the gains from that are considerable, but less than they used to be. But now we need to deal with non-tariff barriers better and with services. Regulation, it's about time we got a regulatory budget and some tighter uh, episode. There's some things we need to regulate. You can't have a fractional reserve banking system without some oversight. However, um, most estimates of reputable people, it's hard to do, but are in the ballpark of the regulatory budget, the regulatory burden on the economy is roughly the size of income tax collections at the federal government. So it would be a good idea to start rethinking and reshaping these things, getting rid of the regulations we don't need and getting streamlined incentive-compatible regulation. This would lead to a more effective, efficient government and one that emphasizes government as needed, and it is needed for many things, often as a last, not first resort, however. But I'm cautiously optimistic we can do that. You think all oh, that's hard to do. I've seen us make progress and then, and then regress in these various things in my career. I'm cautiously optimistic. Previous crises have led people, in my opinion, to overestimate how long they'll continue. And they also lead to a, an environment where it's, you can make foolish policies. In a boom, everything seems affordable. So you don't worry about its ultimate cost. So Medicare wound up costing 1,000 times more than predicted. In a deep downturn, a recession, or God forbid, the Great Depression, needs are so exigent that people can't imagine a time when these programs won't be necessary, so it's very hard to scale them back or get rid of them. In the 60s, we had automation. Everyone thought we'd all be programming for IBM or structurally unemployed. That never happened. We had stagflation, OPEC, and competition from Japan in the 70s and 80s, recently oil, China, and our fragile financial system. The American economy uh, dealt with that. Uh, it was far from perfect, but a lot of uh, several presidents I, I advised over the years made some fairly courageous decisions that cost them politically in the short run and did some good things about them. Uh, America has great advantages. The best higher education system in the world, highly productive workforce, the deepest and most liquid capital market in the world, hence the dollar remains the global reserve currency, allowing us to borrow at lower interest rates. We have the most innovative uh, companies from IT to oil and gas. We have a diverse po population that I think is more supportive of earned success and some disparity in income than uh, other, in many other places. We've had the North American energy revolution uh, that's a, a tailwind at our back. And we have far less severe demographic pressure and much less bloated welfare state than other major economies. China will be older than us in a generation. 
the Europeans, many European countries are going to one retiree per worker, we're going to two to one. So these are big, big issues, but they're not immutable. You take a look at the K through 12 education system that we've been trying to resolve for decades. And anti-competitive forces can throw a lot of sand uh, in the gears. Uh, so it won't be easy. Uh, and I'll test our political capability to do something about it. But I guess if it come to, came down to it, if we maintain a productive, um, efficient market economy, I believe our entrepreneurs and our workers and our businesses and our comp competitive juices will generate substantial economic growth in the future, maybe not quite as high as in the past with slower growth of the labor force. But we can have a much stronger economy and an economy that is very strong for our children and grandchildren. If we look at what's going on in technology, Optimus will tell you about nanotechnology, about Moore's law going to three-dimensional chips, and my colleagues in the computer science department like Hector Garcia Molina will tell us that the software people have been lazy just relying on faster processing speeds. So when they need to, they'll start doing software that uh, sp spreads loads over many chips. So we shouldn't worry about Moore's law running out. Uh, they'll tell us about big data and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's important to understand when people say, well, what's the killer app? It often isn't known until it actually happens. And in a competitive economy, it actually winds up occurring because people drive to what people demand or create markets and let people and get people to demand what they do. James Watt was trying to lift coal, water out of coal mines. Marconi was trying to compete with the telegraph and never envisioned mass broadcast radio. And our most famous inventor, Thomas Edison, sued to prevent his most original invention, the phonograph, from being used for music because he invented it to help the blind. So uh, I don't want to just be uh, simplistic and say, well, it'll just occur. But our best chance of having the kinds of new products generated from our uh, research and our, uh, and our technology that enable a much stronger economy, help us be, lead better lives and our children and grandchildren better lives, depend heavily on maintaining strong incentives in our economy. And again, my view of America is not far from Winston Churchill's, which is you can always trust Americans, America to do what's right after it's exhausted all the alternatives. So thank you very much. So I mentioned Go Warriors. Early, I mentioned earlier that uh, Mark Duggan is going to be the starting pitcher in the fall. But I thought we would start him off with a relief appearance, and he's going to be the closer. So Mark, you handle it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, terrific. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Michael, for a great uh, yeah. Sorry, talk I went so long. Yeah, yeah uh, but let's take uh, let's take let's start with one question from the audience right here. When you talk about productivity as it relates to technology, how is that measured? Because it seems like over the course of the years productivity and, and, and how you evaluate changes dramatically. You think about Airbnb or Uber, and that changes productivity in a different way than worker productivity. So how is it measured, and how has the measure changed? That's a good question, and it's not easy to measure, particularly when we have new products, new services, new parts of the economy, and a larger part of the economy that's harder to measure. For example, productivity in technology and medical care, where it's traditionally very hard to measure outcomes. Uh, we only do it for a f actually well for a few things like cataracts and heart surgeries and so on. Um, so uh, we basically have measures of output and we have measures of hours of work and we divide them. Now there are all sorts of issues about how they're all measured and what's included. So your point's well taken. It's often the case that early on a technology is disruptive. You might even have lower output per worker for a while as people invest in dealing with the new technology. Um, for example, electrification, there was a lot of capital expenditures, railroads, et cetera. And then the question is um, both how, uh, how much it enables people to get done per hour of work and various, and then how broadly applicable it is to the economy. You can have something tremendously disruptive that's a great idea that makes people wealthy that affects 1% of the economy. It's not going to do much. So economies that have broad applicability, like electricity and automobile, uh, things of that sort, 
really transformed a lot of, a lot of uh, production processes and, and a lot of workers' productivity. Some don't, so it's, it's an ongoing process. The statisticians are always trying to get, get better measures, but it's tough. Okay. Uh, how about we take one more question, Mark? Michael, wonderful set of remarks as always. Uh, there's uh, one degree at which it seems that uh, the magnitude of the fiscal problem of which, you know, that we're sort of staring in the face seems, seems overstated. And that is, there's an element of, uh, of, of intergenerational wealth transfer from young to old because of the demographic shift, uh, which is going to trigger increased tax rates to pay for the services. But because workers will be in short supply, wages will have to increase. And so there's a kind of a reversal of the flows that go back to the young by virtue of their being in short supply. And it just strikes me that that portion of the feedback loop is, is never really addressed when we look at these um, things in equilibrium. Um, you raise a good point, but on the other side, the simple calculation I did had no impact of the higher tax rates on the economy in calculating the, how high the tax rates would be. So it's unclear what the net of those two additional effects would be. There are people who've tried to do this. It's not easy to do. It, um, you can argue about um, uh, you can argue about how uh, how much capital deepening would occur in when when people when the workers are in shorter supply, but if they have a lot less capital how much their wages will go up. So uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of puts and takes, but you've, you've got a valid point. Okay, Ted? Pardon okay, me. one more. Leave? Sorry. Still got a few oh, more minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, first of all, wonderful presentation. Uh, you have a point, uh, it's the next to the last one on your cautious optimism. Test political ca capability to make serious, even existentialist long run decisions. And then in a prior slide, you had a projection of the education of the workforce, which is not headed in a positive direction. So the implication there, if you take those two factors together, is that uh, a less educated electorate is liable to make any kind of reforms more difficult because they're going to continue to vote themselves the goodies that are associated with the welfare state. So I just wondered if you had an opportunity to think through uh, the political capability to enact the kinds of reforms that uh, you indicate, and I agree with you, are necessary in order to move this country in a different direction. Uh, yes, I've thought about that a lot, and I've been thinking a lot about trying to project into the future um, who's getting what, how, what their situation is, and how that might affect their vote on things like reforming entitlements and so on. Uh, so I remain cautiously optimistic, but again, it's no more than cautiously optimistic. There's a big risk. Okay, okay I think we'll wrap it up there. So one more time, let's thank Mike Boston. <laughs>